All right, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Bielan. I'm the founder and managing partner of Search Lab. I want to just take a minute to say thank you for coming and taking time out of your schedule today. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to have these three people join me. And we're going to talk about ways you can improve your small business. Um, we all each come from kind of a different skill set. So I think it should be an interesting discussion. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to open the floor to Marie, who's going to talk uh, for an extended speech here as our keynote speaker. And uh, before I do so, I want to just let you know, I, I've known Marie for a year now. We were uh, roommates in a co-working space when we first got started. And um, if you've ever worked in one of those spaces, it's not a lot of privacy, so you get to know each other. But she is the CEO and um, co-founder of At Revenue which is a tremendous organization that I couldn't, I couldn't speak more highly of. Um, as I said, you get to watch their presentations. It's full of emotion and, uh, and passion. And she really does help these businesses to increase their sales revenue. Uh, I'm thrilled to have her here and the team from Matt Revenue. Uh, without further ado, Marie Hill. So I wanted to lay a little bit of a foundation for how all of these brilliant people come together and why we're here today. How many of you are business owners, right? Um, so at some point, you became insane and decided that you were really excited to work a ton of hours for possibly less money than you've ever worked for in your entire life, um, but that there was something inside you that was so meaningful, that you were so passionate about, that you knew needed to be done differently in your market. And so you took the jump. Um, for those of us that were blessed enough to go to college, I'm pretty sure none of us walked, out of the, walked off that stage with the certificate in our hands and had any idea how to actually run a business to profitability. Right? It's like the, um, when you get out of high school and you know nothing about um, how to pay your bills or balance a checkbook, or that manual that they give you when you give birth, how to raise a child from zero to 18 with no mistakes. That's the entrepreneurial jump. Um, and for those of you that are in organizations where you've got to make a name for yourself and you've got to establish yourself as an industry expert, there's not really a good playbook. Oh, trust me, there's a lot of articles. And you can read all of them and confuse yourself to the point of insanity. But how do you actually get there? And what are the foundations of business that help you to level set and help you to identify where the profit's gonna come from, how the sales are gonna come through your business, how the money actually flows to keep it healthy, and what to do with that money to make it grow. So the panel that we've assembled for you today is significant for a few reasons. We've got a couple of gentlemen that know how to get the phone to ring, right? That's the first step, we all need the leads. My specialty is helping people close sales and do it from a place of authenticity, which allows you to be a trusted advisor as opposed to just someone that's trying to get the sale proposed. And then we've got Rebecca, who is able to look at your numbers, work with you to get one, something off of your plate so you can get back to selling. Hello, please and thank you. Um, but two, understand how those numbers work to empower your business. Anybody in the room ever read a financial report from their business and go, uh, okay, no idea what it means, move it to the side, let me just get back to sales, because if I sell more, then everything will be okay, right? It's not always the case. Um, and so as we go through our process today, we've got some, some questions that we pulled together, and we've got some questions from you guys, which thank you very much for those of you that submitted questions. We will be opening the floor after. The, um, the panel discussion, because hopefully we will have sparked some more ideas for you. But what I really want you to, well, let's, I'm not going to sell you a theory, but I'd like you to rent it for just a few minutes here as we go through our speech. I'd like you to look at this through the lens of, if I were to take a holistic look at the practice that I'm running, at the way that I approach business, how would it be impacted if I changed a small part of my marketing, a small part of my sales process, 
a small part of how I look at my finances <coughs> so that I can empower all of those other things to get to the next phase of growth. One of the things that I want to ask, with the entrepreneurs that we have in the room and, and with the folks that we have that are completely sales focused and, and looking to build their own practice with it underneath an umbrella, how many of you are looking to grow your business beyond yourself and have more people be in the pipeline, putting, getting the do done? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, for those of you that know me, um, I tend to think really big. I have big vision, I have big dreams. Luckily, I have an excellent vice president who's a container, so when I have big, crazy, insane like, vision, she goes, yes, but. We can do that and let's take it down now. Um, she calls herself the dream killer. I, I have another name for her that we won't discuss. Um, but having that big vision is a great first step, but that's all it is, is the first step. Being able to put the strategy behind that and truly understand the steps to getting where you want to go. And Really, that first biggest step, how do I know when it's time to bring somebody in? Do I have enough money to, have, to maintain a salary? How do I make payroll? How many sales do I have to have to justify the next person? And do I hire another salesperson so that I can work on the business and the big deal? There's so many questions that go into that and into that growth process that that's what I really want you to be thinking about is as we're here, what's the big vision? How can I grow and how can I give myself the tools that I need to know when it's time to take that next entrepreneurial leap and move into the future? Um, first, returning to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a gentleman who is in the branding and logo industry, he wrote The Worst Business Model in the World, A New Kind of Guide for a New Kind of Entrepreneur. President and head twister, Danny Schumann. And we'd like to invite you to tell us a little bit about what you specialize. Sure. You want to go ahead? So hi, I'm Danny Schumann. I am a writer by trade. I've been a writer my whole life. And I spent most of my career, I had a nine to five job when I was in that world, working for different advertising agencies here in Chicago, about 23 years. And I worked on a lot of consumer packaged goods. Um, I worked a lot with Michael Jordan back in the day because I worked on Gatorade for 16 years, which was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot about how to position a brand to be able to um, have a clear and differentiated position um, that helps you stand out um, in your field. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. For the past 10 years, I've been running a consultancy called Twist. It is a brand marketing and innovation consultancy. We basically help uh, brands, small and big, nonprofit, Fortune 100, we span, uh, uh, it's a large uh, span of businesses, help them understand what their message is, define that message, and bring that message to life to the right audiences. And next I want to introduce um, the CEO and founder of Office Head. She claims she's the big head there, but after learning uh, her love for motorcycles, I want to call her the gear head there. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Rebecca Burnick. I am the founder and big head of Office Head. We are a financial management firm up in Evanston, Illinois. We provide financial management to small business owners. So what does that mean? We provide remote bookkeeping and accounting, but that's just the beginning. Because the power of what we do is we work with our entrepreneurial clients and, and help them to understand how to read their financial reports, how to select KPIs that align with their business goals, and how to take that information and that confidence about your numbers and to create attainable growth plans that will increase revenue and where you can enjoy the profit. So we are a 10-person firm up in Evanston, providing mainland services, and uh, we're trying to help people to eliminate their fear of the person. What is your number one tip for a small business or an NPO, a nonprofit in your industry? From your industry, I should start with me. Yeah. Well, this is going to be this is going to be tricky. My my number one goal is to take care of the low-hanging fruit. And um, there's a lot of things in our industry that are, are very easy. Um, if you're a local business, I suggest that you, uh, you claim your, your Google My Business profile, that you fill out all that information completely. Um, I think that you should have a website with keywords in your title tags and meta descriptions and that kind of thing. 
Um, but I, I would say really take care of the low-hanging fruit first, the easy stuff. And then if I could indulge you, one other tip, make sure you're tracking everything. So you can use analy Google Analytics and you can use Webmaster Tools to make sure that everything you do is being tracked. And so these are just easy foundational things in any campaign that we would start with. But you're already ahead of you know, a, a huge chunk of people who don't even do that much. You know, I'm just going to follow on the, the tracking thing. One of the things that we are constantly doing is looking at the analytics. There's analytics in marketing. There's also analytics in sales. How many dials does it take you to get to a contact? How many meetings does it take to get you to a sale? If you're going to a networking event, how long did it take you to get there? How long were you at the event? How long did it take you to get back to your office? How long did it take you to follow up? How many leads did you get out of it? How many of those leads converted? What's your sales cycle like? What are those numbers like? So that you can understand your key performance indicators in the work that you're doing, networking, speaking, kissing babies. I don't know how your business works, but there's KPIs in that that are going to help you identify the most effective places to invest your time. Guys, we're business owners. Time is our only asset until we start getting really smart people on our team that can help us um, deliver those services. So if you're out networking as a way to build business, how are you authentically connecting with the right people? And my biggest tip in the networking world, how, how many of you go to uh, networking evening events? Uh, net drinking events, right? Um, Listen, whether you're in a room of 12 or 300, your goal should be to find three people that it's worth connecting to, to follow up with. Do not stress yourself out trying to get every stinking business card that's in that room. It's not gonna, there's no value. You're not connecting with anyone authentically. Um, and my other favorite tip for networking in KPIs is a, a little strategy that I call pinwheeling. Um, I actually learned this when I was night clubbing, back when uh, crowbar was a thing, um, where we would go from club to club and pick up um, new friends along the way, and they would introduce us to new friends, and, and slowly but surely we would build our network of people that like to dance to electronic music until 4 a.m. Um, but when we're pinwheeling in the networking world, listen, it's not exactly comfortable to go into a gigantic room where you know no one there. Bring a friend. Bring a friend that knows your business and know their business. And as you're out networking, split up. And when you're in the field, you go, oh my God, Mark, you don't know Rebecca Burnack? Are you kidding me? Rebecca, Rebecca, come here. Come here. You have to know Mark. Mark is, first of all, he's one of the best SEO experts that I've met. He does an amazing job of getting the phone to ring, especially when, when you're doing some consultative sales and you need to get those customer service folks to close it. Mark, you were just telling me that you're in a massive growth mode and you are spending way too much time on your books. She can not only get you out of your books, but show you how to increase the profitability of what you're doing. Listen, I'm going to let you two talk. I'll see you later. Boom. <laughs> so what's happened is you've instantly done a high quality introduction and you don't have to do the follow up, the email connecting afterwards. And that person is doing the same thing for you across the room. For those of you that, that have been in any of my classes and have experienced pinwheeling with me before, it makes it easier, it makes it fun, and you get much better leads out of what you're doing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow um, what Marie was talking about. So I think I know why you asked me to be on this panel now, because I, um, I don't have, like, you guys have this great, awesome, concrete advice that is like, you can do this and the results are going to happen. I don't. And which is awesome because I, I think I'm, a, and which is maybe a good combination and I want to learn more about it, by the way. But I, um, what I do and what I help people do is, a, is kind of upstream from what Marie is talking about. And that is when you go into that room and you need to talk about yourself, how do you quickly, clearly, and compellingly differentiate what you do and make it clear? And that's... I, that's the one tip that I would say from my perspective. You asked me to kind of bring my marketing perspective, and I'm more of a what they call an upstream thinker. So it's kind of it's kind of thinking and the kind of work that a lot of businesses don't necessarily always want to take the time to do, don't want to necessarily spend the money to do it. And once they do it, they say, why the hell didn't we do this sooner? 
So I'm talking about creating a brand position. And that is the usually one sentence that helps you clearly understand if it's just you and your business, how you are going to define your business to a room full of strangers. If, it's, if there are more people on your team, how the people on your team are going to consistently describe your business so that you're all singing from the same hymnal, as they like to say, but so that you're all describing your business the same way. I don't know how many of you have that in your heads. When you go to that event and you're pinwheeling and you're meeting people, are you describing your business the same way every time? Is it clear? Is it compelling? Is it differentiated from the people with whom you're competing? I can help you do that. We can talk about it later if you want. That's not why I'm up here on the stage. You can look it up online and you can figure it out through Google. They can teach you how to do it too. But that's the one thing that I would say is if you are going to make it out in this world and you haven't clearly, compellingly, and uh, differentiate your business from your competitors, then that's something that I would say is the first thing that you should do. That's the number one tip. The other thing I would say, by the way, and I, I know it's only supposed to be one, so I'll make this brief, but um, as, a, as a more of a solopreneur who doesn't have a team, I would say do not undervalue yourself. I'm going to jump on the analytics because I don't believe in bookkeeping for bookkeeping's sake. You know, oh, I have to do this because my accountant said I needed to do this. There's always should be a why. And analytics are really important. So key performance indicators, KPIs. Uh, it's important to know your numbers so you can align your KPIs with what you're trying to accomplish. So a lot of times people will say, well, I don't know what a KPI is and maybe I should pick this one and I don't know. My suggestion is, you're a business owner and you understand the questions you're asking about your business. So jot those questions down. I need to hire, can I afford to? I am I'm too small in my in my space. I need to grow. Can you know, can I afford to give myself a raise? How am I going to? There's all these questions that are operational or business questions. Take those questions and figure out how to answer them through your numbers. So analytics are super important. So, and that's really what we specialize in. So, but my number one tip is to uh, create a financial engine that runs seamlessly in the background. So what does that mean? Pick your tools wisely for your operations. So, um, and I think this goes into a, some questions earlier, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer some of my qu the, uh, question earlier here, but you need an accounting program. So uh, pick an accounting program. Then there are other programs on top of that that will sync with your sync automation, sync with your accounting program that help with your operations. So some people need to track time, others don't. Some people need to reimburse for expenses, others don't. So figure out what your financial engine is and how you operate and then select the right tools for your operations so your financial engine can, smooth, can run smoothly in the background and you can get out and do the sales, the marketing, and the doing. If anybody has a question and would like to ask that. So you both have people here capturing this right now. Um, what, what do you see um, video playing? What kind of role do you see video playing uh, in the future of digital marketing? What I think when I look at content marketing, and for us this is really important because we want to try and earn links from third-party websites. We want to create compelling content. When I look at what people are doing, there's just a saturation of white papers, of wordy blog posts, of uh, case studies, and it's words, and people are, it's, it's, it's overdone. And so when I look at what is actually growing and what is gathering interest, it's always video. Um, it, it really is, from a really practical standpoint, I think if YouTube was a search engine, it would have it would do it would be second the second most searched engine on the world wide web so if you're not there you know it's you should it's not as important to like be looking at your rankings in bing or yahoo or anything like that youtube is really the after google that's the next one that people are using to search so i think what what you're going to find is that you're going to have more compelling content that's more worthy of links that's huge for us your Differentiating yourself from this just really oversaturation of boring content, which is case studies, white papers, wordy blogs. And what's best is every study shows that video content converts better. So this is like, I have a, a, a good friend who this is his number one conversion rate optimization tip is have video. People will stay on your site longer, they'll uh, 
they're more likely to convert, they're more likely to link to you, they're more likely to share your content. So um, I think doing video, I mean, there's a, there's a reason we do it, and I think it's like really important in, in as we look forward to kind of get yourself out of um, looking like everyone else. For those of my evangelists that are in the room, I, I know I've got current and past students in this room, so thank you all for coming. Um, and you can shout out the answer if you remember this from sales class. But when it comes to the psychological um, breakdown of how people communicate, 7% of communication is words. Seven. So if all you're putting out there is words, you're missing 93% of your ability to effectively communicate. 38% of communication is body language or tonality, and the other 55% is body language. So how much of your communication are you leaving on the table if you're not integrating video into what you're putting out into the world? It's yes, you're gonna get the SEO boost. Yes, you're gonna get deeper engagement, but people are gonna understand who you are and why you are better. And they're going to get the purpose of your passion and why you went into business in the first place. Uh, senior portfolio manager asks, how can I brand myself to engage better with new, existing, and prospective clients? I believe this goes to... Uh, how can you brand yourself better? So um, I would say um, focus is probably the thing that I would coach people on the most. I, I think that a lot of people... So the, it was in the question itself. How can I brand myself to new, current, new, current, existing, future... So I'd say potentially first pick one. Um, great marketing is about making tough choices and it's about sacrifice. And um, it's, a, it's a great um, inclination, a tendency that we all have because we have this great offering and this great project, uh, this great product that we work our asses off to make great, but we want to expose it to the most people possible. And so the first thing I would say is really kind of try to have a good understanding of who your most op or your optimal target audience is um, and go from there. So first is audience and second is message. Like what is that focus message that you're trying to tell the world? What is the one thing that once you have figured out your audience, what is the thing that will connect you most quickly and most clearly to that audience that will help them understand why they should pay attention to you? Um, if you have the wrong audience when the right message, if you have the right message in the wrong audience, you will be spending time um, that could probably be spent better um, elsewhere. You will not be optimizing your time as much as you could be. So um, figure out who it is you want to be talking to, figuring out what that message that will appeal to that person or those people best, and go from there. Tough choices, people. Tough choices. Mark, good marketing, tough choices. I was thinking about what you were saying about kind of identifying and focusing. I'm involved in different things where people are always looking to answer the critic, answer the person who's going to give the negative comment or address their work towards kind of the critical person. How do you kind of craft your message so you don't fall into that trap, that you find the the, the audience that you want and then you're able to kind of like knock off and not worry about the, the critical people or the people who aren't getting you. Is, is there kind of a methodology around that or a theory about that? One of the things that we know is that sales is not convincing people of something, right? I'm not there to convince you that email marketing works. If you think newsletters are stupid, I will gladly refer you to my competition, right? I've got like three of them that I don't like and they're <laughs> I will gladly make the referral. Um, we really focus on meeting people that are already on the journey, that know where they want to go, that are already engaged in using outside help. Listen, if you're a consultant, if you're a service provider, if you have a product that you know can, can help them, we want to meet them when they're in that pain point and reaching out as opposed to constantly combating somebody that's that's going in a direction and listen i invite people that are that are in that well you better prove it to me and you bet i invite you to be yourself by yourself because i have people that are on the journey and that are 
ready to make two, three, five X month over month, quarter over quarter, that I can get there much more quickly. Um, and it's, it's exactly what you were talking about. You've got to make those tough decisions. And at the end of the day, if you had a book of business that was full of critics, how happy would you be in your business? So one of the things that we hold very firmly to is um, we use a, a DISC assessment where we identify behavioral styles that are a high D, a high I, a S, or a C. Um, and we have a very strict policy that we don't work with high A's. And I'm going to let you guys figure out what the A word is. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. So I, I figured she would answer it brilliantly. The only thing I would, I would add is that the great thing about being an entrepreneur is that it's your choice. You get to make the decisions. Your work is on your terms. And I'm not saying that because it, gets, it means we can be selfish and, and go off and do whatever the heck we want. But it means that when those choices come, you get to decide what works best for you and your business. And if the haters are haters going to hate, then, <laughs> then, then let them and screw them. I have something to add. So it, it, it does come at a certain point of your business when you're confident enough and you get to make those decisions because at an early part of your business, you sort of have to work with everybody. But then it's a beautiful day when you can wake up and go, wait a minute, I don't need to work with the high A's anymore. So at Office Heads, what we do, we have our values. And we use our values, and one of them is kind of like no A's. But we use those values when we hire and when we do our sales. One of, if, and here's an example, one of our um, values is curiosity because we want our bookkeepers to not just be entering bills and doing things, we want them to take three steps back and be curious like, okay, well, well that looks different or that was higher than last month and they want and to add value. Well, when I'm in my sales process, I'm also asking questions to find out whether or, whether or not my potential client is curious or if they you know all of the values that we hold to your internally we hold dear externally as well and if I find someone who's not in aligned with our values then I then I have that conversation you know you know there's some I see some red flags here that maybe we're not the right partner for you let's identify those and see if 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 you know I can bring you over onto the office head side or I can just refer you to other people just when you're starting off as a business, um, what would be some of the first questions you would ask yourself? It's to try and define yourself, I feel, is probably the best way to go. But more specifically, what questions can you ask to try and start developing a brand and find your target? So um, steal shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, could, I, I, I call that making use of available knowledge. <laughs> So um, I guess I, I started my business by um, spending a lot of time online and looking, what, looking at what people who did what I wanted to do, do well. And what did their website look like? How did they describe themselves? What color templates, what color patterns did they use? What templates did they use? What language did they use? How did they, how did they lay out, out their site? Um, what kind of video, white papers, materials were they offering? I just found, and that's how I advise pretty much all my clients is see what other people are doing well and, you know, steal, sure. But I, you know, I'm a strong believer in borrowing and making it your own. You don't need to use what they're using word for word or color for color. You're going to make it your own, however you choose to do it. But it's a great head start. And why bother starting from scratch when people who are doing it well can teach you how to do it even better? There are trails of success to follow. I would love to say that streaks of brilliance are going to happen and you can dive into something brand new and amazing and nobody's ever done it before. Cool. That's usually like their fifth iteration of never done it before. Um, so the biggest tip that I can give everyone in this room is you got to start somewhere. Sometimes it's ready, fire, aim, so you can see how close you got to the center of the target. And then it's try it, track it, change it. This market is always changing. And if your marketing plan or your sales plan is the same as it was two years ago, guess who's going to be obsolete by next year? So those KPIs are going to come through in a lot of different ways. And a lot of it is just you've already taken the entrepreneurial leap. Keep leaping. Keep trying. And then track the crap out of it. Yeah, I, I agree. And this, my answer would kind of dovetail. There's a lot of ways you could spend your marketing your marketing dollars. So I drive to Northwest Indiana a lot. I see like a million billboards. 
And I always wonder when I'm driving, like, how do they know if that works or not? I have no idea. You know, do you feel like the phone rings more? Then that probably worked. That's, I think, how they, how they evaluate it. The beauty of uh, web marketing, really of any kind, is that you really can know. And so that's good news for us when we do well, and it's really lousy news if, you don't, if you're kind of struggling in a campaign because you're sort of naked to the results. And so one of the things we always, like uh, Jeff's a PM here, so he would, a new client, he'd call them up and he'd ask them a series of questions. And one thing we always want to know is, what do you want your website to do? Do you want to sell stuff? Do you want phone calls? Do you want contact forms or... Uh, appointments, what, what do you want to accomplish with this website? And it's amazing how often you see a website and it's misaligned with those goals. They want to sell stuff and everything's about, you know, call us. But they don't want to be on the phone, they want to be selling. Um, well, you, you can realign those, those goals on a website very easily. And the beauty is you can track all this stuff. So you can know, um, it, it's a great, uh, tagline that I, I likely will steal from here on out there because it's really true. A lot of what we do is like, let's try this web page and we'll just A-B test it against the current version. It, you just find out, okay, this, this works better, this doesn't. Um, and all of this stuff is very trackable. And so I think, you know, for us, it's about identifying what is it that you want your business to do. Is your website currently aligned with those, those goals? If it isn't, we'll change it for you. And then if it is, how can we try and just flood the zone with more opportunities for you? One of the first questions you asked was about KPIs. So I'm going to jump, and it's not about branding, but I'll jump on the financial KPIs. So we believe at Office Heads that you should have about six, no more than six KPIs each quarter. Because every quarter, then you assess and you change. So that, there you go. If you want to try it, change, you know, and then change it, this gives you the opportunity every quarter to change. Now, when it comes for financial KPIs, the two that are mandatory are revenue and profit. So tell yourself, what do I want to be making? How much do I want to increase? And the other one is at the end of the day, how much profit do I have? Now, I'll give you a quick little uh, gap uh, accounting, how to look at a profit and loss statement, it's revenue comes in, expenses go out, and you have profit at the end of the day. But most people bring the money in, spend the money, and go, wow, I have $15. Well, I guess I'll pay myself 10 bucks, and then you kind of move on from there. So there's a new philosophy out there, or there's a philosophy out there called profit first. So you select a percentage of profit that you want, and you take that first. So if you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of money, then start with 0.5% or 1%, but at least you're starting with something. So the revenue comes in, you take 1% of it and stick it in a savings account, and then you have whatever you have left to spend. You become a more thrifty and thoughtful business owner. So you have your profit, and you have, you have your revenue, and you have your profit, and then then sit, sit back and ask the questions, the strategic questions you have about your business. Boy, I think I might want to spend some money on sales and marketing. How much do I want to spend? Huh, well, maybe I'll spend 3%, 5%. Hey, this is a big quarter. I'm going to spend 10%. So then you know whatever you're bringing in, 10% of that is going into sales and marketing. What type of sales and marketing am I going to do? Boom, you push it over. So each then, if you do that quarterly and refresh, you can say, I don't need to worry about my sales and marketing anymore. I think 7% is an awesome percentage. Now I'm wondering, well, should I hire? How much money do I need to hire? And that changes from time to time. So if you take it into quarterly snippets of assessing, reevaluating, and changing your KPIs based on your business needs and desires, you can A, celebrate your successes, which entrepreneurs don't really celebrate often enough, and B, you can take advantage of the wonderful thing of being quick and nimble when you're a small business because you have that information to make those decisions and, and, and grow your business quickly. Uh, they indicated they're always stressed about cash flow and they kind of ask for hot tips on how they could manage that. I feel like it kind of along the lines of what you were just talking about. <laughs> Cash flow, that, that is like the nemesis, <clears throat> excuse me, the nemesis of a business owner. Because you're out there selling, you're doing your thing, the money's coming in, and unless you have a engine, a financial engine coming in and people working it, even if it's you, there comes the day where you go, oh, I have to pay bills, how much money do I have? And unless you know what's coming in, what's going out, and what you need next week and the week after, you're going to get into a cash flow crunch. So um, I mentioned earlier about picking the right tools. There is, so if you pick QuickBooks Online, which is 
uh, first have a quick have an accounting program and QuickBooks Online is a really great accounting program it's it's cloud based and plus Intuit is putting a ton of dollars in it so that's the that's the place to go for small business there's a lot of div other third party developers creating uh, apps that sync with it it's well, the one that I recommend for cash flow is called Float App. It extracts the information from your QuickBooks Online. It get, you can have uh, the budget of what you think it's going to be month after month. Then every time you look in there, it pulls actual with 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 uh, forecast. It says these are the bills you have to pay. This is the money we think is coming in. You can go, oh yeah, but I talked to that guy and that money's not coming in. I'm gonna push it down here, and it will give you a visual of where your cash flow is going to be, and it'll turn <gasps> red if you're gonna go down below the line and it, if it goes up, you hoo you get to celebrate. But then that way you get to select where you're spending your money. So especially when it comes to payroll, so if you even if you're paying yourself, I would love to see solopreneurs paying themselves on a schedule because that only helps your lifestyle at home because you know certain money's coming in, you don't have to stress on the home front either. But when you have employees, you know, the 15th and the last day of the month, you're paying payroll. So rather than on the 10th, you say, oh, I need to pay this insurance bill and this bill here, but you forget that, oh, I have, I have to drop $1,000 next week and I, I don't have it because I just paid this bill. Being aware of what's coming in, what's going out in the next 14 days, and then selectively paying your bills can manage your cash flow. And I just want to say one thing about the times when you don't have any cash flow, um, because it happens. And I, it will. I mean, so I, I don't know how long you guys have been in business, but 10 years, and I should know how long, Marie, T about 10 years. Yeah. So um, the cash will run out at some point. I mean, there are, sorry, that's not true of everybody. I'll say, in, in my case, over 10 years, it's happened a couple times. There are times when, you know, there's enough cash to go to Vegas and get the high roller suite and, you know, get nuts and get the bone-in ribeye. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there are times when the cash runs out. And what I would say to that is um, take a deep breath and have faith and work your ass off because there's always something around the corner. And I'm going to stack on that from a sales perspective. I know that's out of character for me. Um, when you're looking at your KPIs and you know how much money you've got to have coming in, you should have a pipeline that is 3x what you need to be closing. And if you don't have a CRM that shows you what your pipeline is. And most CRMs, most good CRMs, integrate with QuickBooks. So all of those numbers come together and you can get a good picture. If you, if you don't know what you've got in pipeline and where they are in process and what your closing rates are and what your sales cycle is and what all, all of these different pieces are, you're never going to be able to proactively stack your financial pipeline. Um, and Guys, listen, entrepreneurship is a lot about failure, and you got to learn to fail fabulously, but flexible income is a stress that you don't need. So everything that Rebecca said about paying yourself first, listen, I'm still practicing. I think any business owner out there knows that if there's a day that you're not going to make payroll, that's the month you don't take a check. Right? It's our first inclination. We take care of our people first. Um, it's hard to flip that switch and make sure that you're at least covering your expenses and that you can sleep at night. But making sure that that happens means making sure that you know what's in your pipeline and what your closing ratio is. Yeah, I would say one thing. Uh, Noah Weiner's here. If, Noah, if I can try something you, you showed me. And I may ask you to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one of the things that happens when, when we first started Search Lab, everything, you had to do everything. So you had to be uh, in charge of the finances, the, get the website up, get the people hired. Um, decorate? Yeah, decorate, everything. <laughs> right, down to like, yeah, literally like uh, I need, you know, paper in the printer. Um, and what's, what's helpful is you kind of grow your business. Um, you can start to make choices. And I always felt guilty about, I hated the finance meetings. I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't want to do it. It was a trip to the dentist every time. And, um, you know, it, was a, it really was reassuring. I had a conversation with Noah. He said, put on a board, uh, a, like a, a plus sign, right? 
In the top right corner, write down what you really like to do and you're good at. In the top left, you write what you really like to do, but you're just OK at. Is that right? OK. Then in the bottom, you do what you're good at, but you don't like to do. And then in the bottom right, you put what you don't like to do and you're not good at. And so I would put finance in the bottom right. Like, I'm not good at it, and I don't like to do it. And so it helps you inform decisions about your business, is what I'm trying to say. I hire a lot of people to keep us organized, because I don't like to. I need it, and I don't like to be the person to do it. I hire people to help us with our finances, because I hate doing it. And I need people I can really trust to do that for me. And if you are probably, you know, like Rebecca maybe would say, I love that. It relaxes me to go through uh, you know, a profit loss statement or something like that. Yeah. Uh, this is like catharsis or something. Um, this is like catharsis or something like that. But I, I don't enjoy it. Um, she maybe is like sales and marketing and writing. Uh, that is just awful. You know? And I, I really liked that exercise. I would recommend it to other people. As you kind of, when you're first starting out, you got to do everything. There's no, no way around it. But it can help you make decisions as you're growing about what kind of people you want to hire, what sort of skills you want. Because it's, to Danny's point earlier, you get to do whatever you want, but like you do have to pay your bills. Somebody has to watch the finances. So if you're not going to do it, you have to find someone who will. What's a CRM that you would recommend for an SMB? Because I, I have a franchise, and we use a dirty CRM that's issued by Siebel, which is information over here. And when you were like, oh, you need to know your closings and all that stuff, I'm like, Phew. so. So there are a million flavors of CRM out there, right? So the first thing that we do when we're looking at CRM is we, we look at the digital culture of the organization. Listen, guys, if you have a Google brain, do not use a product that is geared towards Microsoft because it will break you, right? And if I, if I go into a company and they are all Microsoft and I try and put them in a Googly product, product they don't use it. They don't engage. Um, one of, for those that are Google brained, what, what's your culture? What do you use digitally? Okay, good. So, there you go. Okay, so one of our favorite products is Insightly. Insightly is, um, it's very intuitive. You can go in and navigate in like several different ways to get wherever you want to go. You need to be, you need to go into it with a plan, though. You have to build your pipelines. You have to build your KPIs in there. You have to understand what activity sets go with getting the lead into the pipeline. Are you engaging in marketing automation? How are you, what's the sales cycle like? And what are the KPIs in that sales cycle that lets you know that you're going to close? Um, if you have salespeople that work with you, it's amazing because it allows you to see where everything is so that you can plan for the revenue. Um, it also integrates into your MailChimp, into your Google. You can add tasks and opportunities and all of those things all from the same screen. It integrates with your QuickBooks. There's, you want to look for something that integrates with the tools that you're most comfortable with. And if you need help with that, if you want to ask some additional questions, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation with you and, and give you a little tour of Insightly. If you pick a product as an owner that you cannot champion in your organization, that you can't fall in love with and get the value out of, nobody else is going to use it. It will fall by the wayside and be another expensive thing that you did that doesn't ever take. Um, so there's a lot of flavors. The big ones, the you know, there's the HubSpots, Infusionsoft, um, Salesforce, all of these monoliths of um, CRMs that have a billion features, they can often overwhelm the small business. It's too much. There's too much that has to go into it to get it to work right. So if you are starting off, find something small and nimble and then grow it from there and always keep an external map of what you've put into it so that if something happens and that CRM blows up, 
you can easily take that methodology to the next one because in the background, they're all very much the same. But it's the, the intellectual property that goes into building the KPIs and the activity sets and the flows that are truly what make it successful. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank Come you. Talk to us. Yeah.